started here. Um, it's Monday. Thanks for coming back to all of our friends in the chat room, to everyone new. If you're new, uh, this is Voltage Control Lab, Mod City Live, uh, Spring Break Edition. We're continuing, and we, we do this every day. We're going to be going through uh, different topics this week. I think on Wednesday, we'll do another make a track together live type of thing. Uh, last week, we talked about doing a lo-fi track or uh, someone had mentioned um, a drum and bass track with all samples from uh, kitchen sounds, things like that. Um, we'll see what we get with that. But I figured in the other days of this week, maybe including Saturday, we'll get into the make noise maths class that I built for Voltage Control Lab many years ago and just go through the lessons in this class, which basically breaks down pieces of the illustrated make noise maths manual to kind of connect the dots between some of these things. Uh, Maths is a uh, really one of the most popular Euro rack modules out there. Uh, if you guys know in the chat room of any VCV rack versions of maths or reactor blocks versions of maths or anything like that, let us know. Um, I couldn't find any, but um, it's one of these modules that can kind of do a lot of things. Um, uh, can almost do anything in terms of basic synth functions to some extent. Um, so we're going to go through the uh, four levels that I built for that class, and we're going to uh, do that over the next few days. We'll take a break on Wednesday. We'll do some more sound recreation from tracks that you like, that you suggest on Friday. But that means today, tomorrow, Thursday, and Saturday, maybe we can just go through the four levels of this um, Make Noise Maths course that I built a long time ago. And um, while we're at it, this is Voltage Control Lab, voltagecontrollab.com, at vcontrollab on Twitter, at voltagecontrollab on Instagram. And you can find me on all of those things at Computo. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm a sound design and music production instructor at Musicians Institute in Hollywood, California, as well as Icon Collective in Burbank, California. And so, yeah, let's get into some make noise maths. Any shout outs from the chat room? Roboclops, what's up? HR Terror, good to see you again. Uh, curtains, thanks for stopping in. Mike G, thanks for coming in here. Um, let's get a link to the. Uh, let's see. Can I share this? So, if you have the Make Noise um, Maths Illustrated Manual, let me find that real quick. Sorry, I was looking at my version of it. Illustrated manual. Let's see what this says. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. G. Dizzle, Ed, Curtains. Hi again. Kyle, good to see you. Thanks, you, uh, you, blah, 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 blah. Thanks, you guys, for coming in here. Here is the link. This looks like it's on the UC Santa Barbara website. I think this is the same thing. There's a black version of it if you like the, the you know, if you've got an all black and gold system or something and you want the black version of this. Whoops. Um, no, this is going to be the legit um, Make Noise Maths Illustrated manual because I don't want to, I don't want to break it up. I don't own that manual. I don't know if there's a copyright on it. So I figure you guys can... Uh, click that link, hopefully, and you'll see the Make Noise Maths illustrated manual, which gives us some nice 
visual reference to um, some uh, uh, some patches, some common patches with the Make Noise Maths um, module. And some of these are complicated. And to get it the, the, the full picture, they've included a, des a description on the right-hand side of the patch uh, with how it's set up and, and uh, kind of what's going on in that patch, as well as a kind of static view of what the oscilloscope should look like when we set these patches up. Um, and right off the bat with this triangle function LFO, they start out with a not too complicated patch, but I think getting to it might be, might be a little bit uh, uh, worth the, the walk there. So um, if you guys don't know the Make Noise Maths module, this is it. And this is a many function device. This thing can do a lot of different functions. And we're gonna start with some of the most basic functions and how we can take that into uh, some more interesting directions. So, um, and we'll start with the first few patches in the illustrated manual. So um, we're gonna bring up this patch. that move it around up here um, so this is basic a basic LFO that we can uh, you know we're really kind of starting with like what is the simplest thing that we can do with maths and probably the simplest thing we can do with maths is patch from one of the outputs at startup um, if you notice the let's bring these sort these windows out here no set path, Grant, what's up? Thanks for hopping in here. Okay, and now we should be on, okay, now, now we're looking at maths. Okay, so let's go into oscilloscope mode. When we start up maths, it starts with, with two cycling waves, and maybe, you know, before we even get into too much of the patching of it, let's just try to make some sense of the landscape here. Um, there are four channels on maths, and we can see those indicated at the very bottom with four different separate outputs, okay? Maths has four channels. The, the first and fourth channel are the left side as the first channel, and this top attenuverter, this white knob in the middle, controls elements of this channel. Channel four is this entire right side, which includes this bottom attenuverter. Now, we can use each of these channels in many different ways, but on their own, without anything patched in, we can use them as function generators and uh, uh, signal generators. So there will be, uh, we, we can also use this thing as a mixer. There are four signal inputs. This arrow input here to the left, this arrow input to the right. Those are signal inputs for each of these channels. And then there's an input up here that connects to our second uh, attenuverter and an input here, which connects to our third attenuverter. Hopefully you guys can see that on the kind of, uh, th with these kind of, uh, lines connecting the attenuverters and the inputs. Um, on their own, we can use each of these channels with these outputs, the one, two, three, and four outputs. So it doesn't have to be a mixer per se, it could just be a signal processor, a signal manipulator. Um, we also, below those four outputs, sorry, just fixing my microphone here, we have some mix outputs. The some input at the bottom. This is kind of the, the, the mixed, the main basic mixed output. Volume too low, try turning up your channel. And let me move the mic a little bit closer to my face. What's up Fantosh? What's up Babe, Baby Bob Buzzful? <laughs> okay, 
So um, it's a great name. Hopefully this is better. Make sure you turn up your level on your uh, YouTube. The Okay, so the, the only level that we should really even be hearing right now is my voice. But continuing, these outputs, the OR and the inverse outputs, these are alternative manipulative mix outputs. The OR output only sends positive signal. The invert, uh, the inverse signal inverts the sum output. Okay, thanks, man. I appreciate the audio confirmation. It's a constant battle with these mics. Not the best setup, but we're doing what we can. Okay, so now we also have these additional outputs at the bottom. Notice that channel one and channel four have these oscillating green lights, these, these LEDs. And next to them, they have these additional outputs, the EOR, the EOC. These outputs send the full voltage signal from whatever's happening on channels one or four. This is what they call the unity output, the unity output. Um, and then following what's happening on those channels, these far left and right outputs send gates. This one sends a gate at the end of the rise on channel one. So whenever we get to the end of that rise signal, we're going to get a gate from there. Whenever we get to the end of the fall cycle on channel four, we're going to get EOC, end of cycle. So once we rise and then fall back, we're gonna get a, a, a gate. Um, and we'll visualize how that all works in just a moment. But we can also modulate the rise and fall time. What do those things mean? Again, we'll plug one of these in in just a moment and see. And the, maybe we can scoot this over a tiny bit so we can get a better, there we go, better view of the oscilloscope. Um, we also have a cycle gate, so we can turn on and off the looping of these two channels. And we're gonna start to patch this now and see exactly how these things all work together. So starting on channel one, or sorry, page one of our um, Make Noise Maths Illustrated Manual, which is linked up above in the notes if you got it, uh, or you can just Google it. We can take either the number one output, which will be scaled using this attenuator, or the unity output. Let's just take the unity output for a moment, and we're gonna patch it in to our oscilloscope. Set this to a five volt range for each of these boxes. So that gives us a 10 volt, zero to 10 volt rise and fall. If we change our rise and our fall times here, set the very response knob to people outside screaming, adding some flavor here. So we're just gonna try to dial this in, see what's coming out of this thing. So we've got a t zero to 10 volt signal coming out of the unity output. Trying to get it to freeze there. Let's change the time range. So we're getting a looping signal coming out of this thing. Set these to noon or so. That way we can see the, I'll just go a bit longer wavelength there. Okay, so now we can see the rising and falling cycle. So this is just one channel in cycle mode. As it starts up, it is generally in cycle mode unless you've got some Maybe the old one doesn't do that, but the modern maths module does, maths 2.0, uh, MK2, whatever you want to call it. We're taking that unity output and we're getting a rising and falling signal, a triangle LFO. 
We can modulate the size and shape of that LFO by changing the rise and fall time. The rise is the zero to 10 edge. You can see as I turn that all the way down, we get more of a sawtooth wave. Turn it up. That front edge of the sawtooth wave is elongated. We get closer to a triangle wave. And this is, keep in mind, a unipolar triangle wave. It's rising from zero volts, coming back down to zero volts. Um, we could, of course, use the output of this to control, uh, say, a VCA. braids in here. Sorry, not braids, plates. And let's unmute that channel. Just getting some volume control. We shorten the fall time, get a ramp wave. And as we alter the position of this very response knob, the knob below the rise and fall, this one, notice that it's got three extremes, really. The, the, what we might consider zero is this linear position where there's a tiny little line on the probably can't see that on screen. I guess right where this position is located is a tiny line in that log to exponential graphic that moves around this particular knob. And you notice that the wave shape here is looking pretty flat. As we go to the left towards the logarithmic side, the waveform, the, the rise time starts to extend in length. Get a longer rise time and that rise shape starts to look less like a line and more like a curve so this affects the perceived length of the rise and fall time as well as the shape Extend this, extend this back to more of a triangle type of shape. So this is fully logarithmic, looks a little bit more like a rounded hump now. And push it back towards linear speed uh, 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 increases. You can extend out the rise and fall time again. As we go the other direction, towards exponential, You see, we get these almost thin pulses. We can, of course, elongate our rise and fall time again. So curving back the other direction. Back to linear, shorten those times. Okay, so this is a, you know, we're, we're I, I see what you're saying there, Benjamin, in terms of it often feels like we're just twisting knobs when we're trying to learn a module. This is why it's most important to kind of strip things back to their bare minimum, at least when you're trying to learn the thing, right? The, 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 the experimentation, the playing is, I think, just as important in this world of modular synthesis, but um, at the same time, if we want to learn this thing to its most, you know, deep level, to the learn it uh, so that we can employ it in 
patches in a less experimental way, in a more predictable way. Sometimes it's helpful to kind of strip it all back down. And of course, this is very stripped down, right? There's nothing going in. There's only a signal coming out that's controlled by these three knobs. And if we look at channel four, we're gonna see the exact same thing. It's going to look exactly the same, rise and a fall time. And then we have this very response control again here that um, you know these are the exact same functions as we see on the left side. So no drastic, uh, difference there. If we can learn one side, we've learned both sides. Okay, so um, now what happens if instead of coming out of this Unity output, we come out of the channel one output? Well, nothing's going to happen until we start to turn up this channel one up or down, this channel one attenuverter. And as we turn it up, let me see if there's... Uh, something I can use to maybe slightly block the light on this thing. I'm trying to get a book in here or something. Let's see. Not much of a difference. Oh, that's a little bit better. Okay, that's a little bit better. Now, um, as we start to increase the or, or decrease the attenuverter level, let's turn it to the right from 12 o'clock. Notice there's a little line there at the top of that attenuverter as well as the, at each one. These do not have detents, as they call them, the, the point where the knob kind of like feels like it's falling into a notch and holding perfectly at noon. And that's maybe, um, you know, a, des a design decision to kind of keep things, um, you know, it's kind of forcing us to use our ear a bit, right? Or a little bit of visual reference. But at around noon, that should be at about zero. Nothing should be coming out of the, out, the channel one output. Notice the LED is still flashing. So it's still generating a signal. It's still in cycle mode, thanks to this button. If we turn that off, of course, stop cycling. But now as we start to increase this level or channel one attenuverter level control, let's turn it to the right. And we're gonna see the amplitude of the signal increasing here. And we can kind of bring it back to zero, no signal. It is, exactly. This is basically the amplitude control for channel one. And notice at its fullest, we're getting a zero to 10 volt rise and fall there. Right, if we go the opposite direction, we're not gonna hear much here because we're going from silent to lower signal, but now we're going into the negative range, zero to negative 10 volts, right? Now, when would that be useful? Well, we could use it for sidechain control. Um, if we're trying to alter, if, if we, for instance, instead of maybe mapping this to volume, if we map this or not map it, we're gonna route it to the pitch control then we'll notice a drastic difference. Get a longer, long enough cable here. Okay, so we're gonna go to the volts per octave input and we're gonna set this back to zero. So we should have a very, very thin line here. We have to do this by ear maybe. Yes, this does depend on this being in cycle mode, right? So as we turn, in, turn this to the positive direction, 
The pitch is going to start moving up and back down to the tuned pitch on the oscillator. It's not oscillating around that pitch as a bipolar LFO would. It's going up from that pitch and back down. We could slow that down a bit. What's up, DivKid? DivKid in the chat room. Good to see you there. So as we go into the positive direction, the pitch goes up. Volume too low, thank you. I forgot my voice side change for you. Modular input. So you can see as we go to the positive direction, the pitch goes up and back down to the original tuning. Let me know if that's too loud or too soft. Um, if we go the opposite direction, we can turn it to the negative range, and the pitch is going to go down and come back up. Only one needs to be in cycle mode. We're only using one of those channels. So this one can just kind of sit quiet. taking it way down into the lower range. So we're really talking about uh, an attenuverter here, right? If, um, if we just route a signal into channels one, two, three, or four without any of them in cycle, then we can use these to invert or control the amplitude of any signal. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll play around with that in a minute. Now, we can also speed this up so that it's oscillating at full audio rate. So now I'm going to plug the output of maths channel one directly into the mixer. Okay, or into a VCA, whatever you please. And um, this is again going to be a unipolar signal. But as we increase the speed, as we turn up the rate, right, we shorten the rise and fall time. As we increase this signal, Oh, let's put it back into cycle mode. That would help. We're going to be generating, instead of a low frequency oscillator, an audio rate frequency oscillator. So now we can turn this on. We might have to speed these up. There we go. This is a loud signal, probably. knob to change the perceived pitch. Okay, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, but the point here is that we can speed the rates up to the point where we're getting we're getting a noticeable uh, uh, tone, right? The, 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 the frequency that, uh, of the rising and falling signal from channel one or channel four can get up to audio rate and act as not just a low frequency oscillator, but a audio rate oscillator. So changing the rise and fall time is a matter of modulating the rise or the fall CV inputs or the both CV input. If we, one thing that we could do here is we could employ the output of the other channel 
and modulate the time on this channel. So we could put channel four into cycle mode and maybe we give it a fast rise and a long fall time. So we're basically shaping a sawtooth wave here. Let's visualize that real quick. Okay, so this is channel four. What's coming out of channel four? So a long sawtooth wave. Something like a long sawtooth wave, right? Okay, and we're going to hear that uh, effect on the pitch here. But if we hear, or if we route that instead of to the oscilloscope, if we route that to say change the fall time there on okay so we're gonna now listen to this signal So what's happening right now? We've got a wave shape on channel one. Without any modulation, that's how fast it's modulating the frequency on plates. Fast. Right, we're just doing some pitch modulation with an LFO to the volts per octave input on our oscillator. And it's static, it's happening at a certain rate, right? It's happening in a certain shape. That, that uh, laser kind of sawtooth modulation on the pitch, right? So if we change the fall time, changes the length of that pitch change. And it, you know, if we take the pitch down on the oscillator. Might sound like a lot of kick drums. Okay, so we're gonna take that signal, maybe speed it up. And we're gonna modulate it with this slow sawtooth shape, which is going to speed up the fall time, right? As this thing falls, this fall time here is going to rise. So we'll hear that. And we can see the kind of inverse shape of this thing. We route channel four's output into the channel two on our oscilloscope. Limited real estate here to work with my hands. So we have to turn up channel four's output. So the blue line is the channel four. And as it goes down, as it goes up, the fall time goes up. As it comes down, the fall time gets shorter and we end up with this modulating length envelope. We could instead modulate the rise time. Or 
or we could modulate both. And notice this has the opposite effect. As the as the 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 sawtooth wave, that long sawtooth wave goes high, the pitch speeds up if we pass it into the both input. As opposed to the rise and fall signals, which work in the inverse to that. If we patch the same uh, sawtooth shape into the fall or the rise time, we're going to get a slowdown and a speed up. High, and it's going down lower, and we're going to get a faster fall time now. Same with the rise time. But in the both input, as the sawtooth wave goes high, now these speed up, and then they get longer. Okay. So, we're modulating the rise and the fall time. And if you notice, when we send a signal into the both input, as we just looked at, we get an, uh, a, a shortening of these settings. As the signal goes higher in the both input, the time of the rise and the fall gets shorter. Hmm. Interesting. So that means if we set this to audio rate control, right? If we instead of controlling the pitch now, we route this channel on maths to the output, dial it into an audio rate wave shape. Let's unmute it. So now this is maths modulating on its own. It's just, or oscillating on its own. It's not a low frequency oscillator anymore. It's an audio rate oscillator. And that means that if we were to say modulate the both time, say using a sequencer, maybe we'll try the voltage block or something like that. Then as we do that, the signal goes higher. The frequency gets faster and higher. As the signal goes lower, the s frequency goes lower. Let's try it out. Let's take a sequence from the voltage block. We're going to route it into the both input. And I have to send that a clock. And I will randomize the pattern. Okay. So let's unmute this channel and see what we get. Higher notes sound like higher notes. Lower notes sound like lower notes. So we can sequence this oscillating side of maths. Right? We can send a note sequence into the both input, and we can get some sort of musical passage to be played. Now, this isn't going to work quite the way that we expect a quantized sequencer to work. We could send a quantized signal and sequence, you know, set to uh, a major scale into that both input, and it's not going to track like our calibrated one volt per octave input oscillators are going to track. Um, it's 
uh, now there's a I suppose a potential that we could set this to a certain value set, like a certain combination of, of uh, settings to get something like a volt per octave input. But um, this is a uh, trigger out from a sequence. We're not really even sequencing it with a trigger right now. This is just acting right now as an oscillating, a, a, you know, a cycling rise and fall, a, a mono, what am I trying to say? A unipolar signal that we've routed to the output, that we've routed to the mixer, basically. And we're using that both input to modulate the pitch from a sequencer. Now, that might seem weird to us to consider, well, this doesn't follow a volts per octave um, uh, standard. Why would I use that? Well, because that's boring. And, uh, the, or at least the quantized use of it might be boring, especially depending on what style of music we're trying to make. Um, it's, there, there's, this is another option available to us, is basically my, my point to you. So, knowing that we can, okay, maybe we're straying quite a bit from the illustrated maths manual at this point, uh, but we're just going to keep rolling with this because um, I think this is a fun way to use maths to begin with. Um, you know, now we're, we've gone from LFO with a slower rise and a fall time, right? Slow rise and fall time. A unipolar 0 to 10 volt or 0 to negative 10 volt um, uh, LFO to an audio rate oscillator that we can route to the output and hear and even modulate using that both input. But we have two of those, right? We have two of these oscillators that we can make oscillate at this type of a, uh, of a rate, right? We also haven't even looked at the end of rise output. What happens when we route that output? Well, first of all, no control over the... No control over the attenuator, right? Because this is a direct output. At audio rates, of course, this gives us a square wave. And if we zoom in a little bit on this, and we change the rise or the fall time, we see that we start to also change the pulse width. So this is also something that we could potentially send a sequence to. You might get some wild tonal change. Okay, now we're starting to get wild. Okay, so the end of rise output, of course, at a slower rate is just going to give us a, a gate. And that gate length, that gate, sh you know, kind of related shape is going to depend on the rise time, the rise length, and the fall length, okay? Depending on the length of the fall, we'll get a higher and longer uh, positive voltage. The end of rise is controlled by the combined fall and rise time. If the rise time is short, we get a very short period at zero. However long the fall time is, that's how long our gate will stay high. Okay, and this is just a zero to 10 volt gate signal, square wave LFO, unipolar square wave LFO. Right? Yeah, data is very handy.
for this type of thing. So now we have two of these oscillators. Let's route. Well, how did I have this? Let's route the output of channel one out again. We're going to put that into the kind of audio rate spectrum. There we go. And we're going to take the output of channel four now. We're going to route that into the both input. Now, what's this going to do? Well, nothing until we start cycling channel four. Channel four isn't really going to do anything until we start it cycling. And maybe we'll dial in a sawtooth wave here. As we start to increase the amplitude out of channel four's output, the signal's gonna come out of this and into the both input. And it's gonna start to frequency modulate. Of course, do that that frequency modulation at LFO rates, so it's not really FM synthesis. It's more just pitch modulation using the LFO. And as we speed these up, we can increase the index. So now we're starting to do some frequency modulation from one oscillating cycling channel of maths out of that output four into the both input. So starting to get into some, let's turn off that channel, some interesting tone shaping. Now let's say we wanted to still control the pitch. Well, we might need to use the uh, uh, the maths section, the channels two and three, and one of these outputs along the very bottom of the module, the sum output specifically. Now, anytime we patch a, a cable into the one, two, three, or four output, that channel will be removed from the mix output. So that leaves, you know, channel one is mapped, uh, patched out of output one. So that's not going to be added to the sum output or the or or inverse output. We'll get to the or or inverse output on another day. But the sum output is currently going to take the additive qualities of, it's going to add together the signals from two, three, and four, unless we patch out of one of those as well. So we could take, our channel four output, or we only don't even need to take the channel four output. We'll take the sum output. I'm gonna turn the cycling off on channel four, and I'm gonna route the sum output into the both input. Okay, so right now we should just hear pretty much our low oscillating tone. Right, and now what? We're gonna take 
Well, we can offset the pitch with channels two or three. Without anything patched into these, these will act as offsets or inverters. And so we can, as we turn up one of those channels from zero, we're sending a positive direct current out of the sum and it's turning up the both input, right? You could also go the opposite direction. Making the pitch go lower, right? We're, it's just like sending a long held step on a sequence. If it goes positive, then the pitch from wherever we're currently tuned is going to go up. If the pitch, or if the, the signal goes into the negative range, it's a low direct current, a negative direct current, the pitch is going to go down from our current pitch. Okay. Now, if we send a signal into one of those inputs, say our sequence from before, and then I turn up that signal, it's going to, instead of sending a direct current, it's going to control the amplitude of the sequence. So at zero, we shouldn't hear much change at all. But as we turn up that in, that uh, uh, um, verter, we're going to be increasing the amplitude of the sequence, so we should hear the sequence start to come in and change the pitch. What's up, Astrofish? Nathan, what's up? Trying to catch whoever I, I missed in there. Now, if we increase that signal even more, the amplitude of the sequence should increase, giving us a sequence of the same, a similar shape, but going higher in pitch at the high parts. The relative tuning is going to change. It's the same kind of shape of high and low pitches, but the range of pitches has extended. Notice the pitch, the low pitches are still the same. Now, why do it this way? Well, one reason might be because now we could cycle channel four and we could start to create a sense of frequency modulation as well as the sequence performing, right? So let's turn this back on. And now we'll turn on channel four to cycle. We shouldn't hear much change until we turn up this channel four attenuverter. Mixing together frequency modulation, uh, you know, a loose sense of frequency modulation. This isn't sort of our, you know, controllable frequency modulation. This is more of a wacky, less predictable frequency modulation, but that's okay. Also offset the whole thing using channel three because there's nothing going in there. It's still acting as a DC offset. We could take the whole thing down and pitch kind of. sequence controlling the the pitch of channel four right it has a both input as well dropping cables everywhere we could send another sequence in to control its pitch
we're not doing any volume control of this. This is just like constant right now, but. And these are totally different sequences, so it might also be interesting to send the same sequence. So now we're doing some complicated modulation here. Um, we could also, we talked about this the other day, the idea of that, that stevio style um, blending together of sequences of different lengths, right? So no channel four now. We're just going to take channel one. Let me mute channel one because it's going all slow. Um, now we can maybe turn it up. Let's see. That's nice. Okay. So we're going to take, I'm going to shorten our sequences here. I'm going to make one sequence that's like three steps long. Let me select the right sequence. This one. Length will be three steps. So we should have, have a three-step sequence. And maybe we can slow down the clock. Here. Okay, this should be a little better. Let's send in a three-step sequence. There's a three-step sequence, and we're going to take another sequence, which I'm going to make a four-step sequence. Okay, and that's going to be this sequence. Whoa. Okay, so we're going to take the first one, we're going to put it in here, we're going to put the second one in here. So that second channel set to around 12 o'clock, we're not hearing much of that four step sequence. If we turn this down and turn up our four step, now if we turn both of them up, Add that three-step and that four-step sequence that are playing at the same tempo and are now overlapping. And before we hear them repeat, they have to go three times through the four-step and four times through the three-step, 12, 12 steps total. change one of these or invert one of them. We get a total change out of the sequence. reason Stevio does this with a precision adder is because you can get a lot more precise with the math. You can turn things on and off and, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of control the signal a little bit better. We could put a mute control in here, right? Div kids in here or was in here. The, he's got a mute module. We could put in between our sequences and the inputs on the channels so that we could switch off those channel completely. Uh, the idea here is that we can use short little pieces, right? Even from, you know, right now I'm using the voltage block. It might be a little bit more 
gratifying something like this if we were using just some knob control sequencers because we could just change one note and it would change start to make the feeling of the whole thing evolve a little bit and uh, so you know the idea here is that we can start to get some pretty complicated combinations of signals happening using this sum output and these middle two channels right one this is you know really all maths doing the signal generation and the uh, uh, control of the sequences, right? Um, and then of course we could turn this back on, start doing some frequency modulation as well. Now channel one is even, or channel four is modulating itself out of the OR output. tones out of there. Yeah. So um, I think we're starting to get into a couple of the 
ideas here with maths. We're not routing too much into it right now. We're not triggering these channels yet. Um, we're just playing with what these channels can do when cycling and then maybe starting to send some signals into these other inputs. Now, we're sending sequences in there. There's no reason we couldn't send other oscillating tones in there, right? There's two inputs. We send, instead of a held sequence, an oscillating sequence, right? What if we send an LFO into that input? Get it going in there. Sequence this thing. We're simply listening to maths oscillating actually right now. This is channel one on maths in cycle, right? In a in a, a cycling mode. And then routed to the os or routed to the the VCA and or mixer, whatever whatever you want. We're hearing actually channel one cycling. Now the pitch, the, the rise and fall times are being modulated by a, an LFO external to maths by routing into the both input from the sum output down here. Now we could just bypass all of that stuff and just route an LFO right into the both input. But if we want to control the amplitude of that LFO, we can route it into that channel two input, route the channel two output out to both. Get rid of this one. And then we can use channel two's attenuator to control the amplitude of that LFO. So if we speed up that LFO. And if we, instead of using channel two output, we use the sum output, we can also add in channel four's modulating. Go down to a lower pitch on our main oscillator now. So now we're using two oscillators added together the LFO and channel four added together from the sum output to modulate channel one. You can take this one out, route it into the both input. Now changing the speed of the LFO changes the speed of the rise and fall time on channel four, which is modulating channel one. That's, um, you know, using uh, what is, you know, math's really doing when it's cycling. It's acting as a low-frequency oscillator. So can we take it up, right? Can we kick that thing up a notch and play it at an audio rate? Uh, you know, um, Wambra makes a good point there, which is you can do all kinds of stuff with maths. And the question then becomes... I could do everything with maths. We could just have a whole system of maths. And uh, uh, when we only have one, which most of us probably do, we end up wondering, well, what should I use it for this time? And um, that's kind of where we're starting to go with this, hopefully. You know, it can be 
a weird and funky oscillator. It can be potentially a very complex oscillator, right? We talked last week about uh, using a complex oscillator as kind of a main oscillator and a modulation oscillator. Um, you might find more options on a true complex oscillator, but it can kind of act as that, where one of these is acting and modulating the other, which we're, we're hearing. And once we start getting comfortable with some of the internal patching, the, the inbreeding, as I think uh, Surichai called it, um, the, uh, you know, this thing starts to get very interesting and, and complicated. So I think maybe we'll leave it there for today and come back to maths again tomorrow. Start looking at um, the function generating side of maths, um, not just as a looping function generator, but as a an envelope, right? Let's see. Yeah, and you know, the more complicated, just to mention, the more complicated we start to get with one patch in maths, of course, we start to limit its use outside of that patch. If we're just using one channel as an LFO and another channel as a um, an envelope and the internal channels, you know, as offsets or something like that, then, you know, we've got a lot of things happening in maths at that point, maybe using it for a lot of different things inside of a complicated patch. But if we're starting to use it like we did later in the show today, that's when things start getting, uh, you know, extra um, focused with maths, where we might not have anything left over much to to mix in. But the, you know, I have to say the the separate outputs, along with the mixing outputs here and the unity outputs, gives us a lot of room to use these uh, these channels in multiple ways, and um, you know, so. If we are using an envelope or an LFO um, or using one channel as those things, one of those things, we might be able to patch it out using one of the alternative outputs and get some additional uses out of it. So, okay, let's bring it all back here. Uh, dancing baby is dancing on the cat again. And I've got a cat in my desk chair here took my seat oh, everyone wants to see me everyone wants to see you come here yes you are a good kitty everyone wants to see mog this is mogi her turn <laughs> so yeah i think uh Sorry, I had to do a cat check there. Thought we would uh, maybe conclude it there. Any thoughts, any questions, any complaints, any uh, um, rants, you know, let it all out. You guys can, you know, put it all in the chat, whatever. Um, so, yeah, maybe tomorrow we'll continue with this, if that makes sense, and uh, keep the maths train rolling, get into envelopes. Let's look and see what, if anything, I missed today. Yeah, I usually get into attack decay envelopes. We talked about that in the envelope day on the AD use of the trigger input and the ASR use of the gate input on those channels. We'll remind ourselves that tomorrow. We'll look at the um, portamento or glide slew limiting functions tomorrow. Um, yeah, once we start getting crazy with this thing, it uh, starts to go wild. And, you know, if you guys notice any maths-like modules in our commonly used virtual modular environments. Um, let us know and we'll pass those along to everybody who doesn't have a maths so they can try it out. Um, sweet.
Yeah. So tomorrow we'll do this all again. It looks like Mylar Melodies is doing a, um, a live show now, too. So um, let's all go check that out. Tomorrow we'll be back. VoltageControlLab.com, at VControlLab on Twitter, at VoltageControlLab on Instagram. And, yeah, sweet. Thanks for coming, guys. See you tomorrow. <laughs>